I'm going to, by the mercies of God, just lay out a burden that is on my heart. And I titled it, My Son, Give Me Your Heart. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26. I read from the NKJV. If it's there, it says, My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. Holy Spirit, help us. Amen. I don't know if you like me. I ask a lot of questions, you know, and I've been wondering how it is that we thank God for the Church of Christ, the Capstone Church, the body of Christ in general. We thank God for what God is doing in this season. But I've been wondering and, and, and you know, thinking, you know, how it is that the, the number of churches versus the transformation we see in our land does not add up. If you have observed that, observe that with me, it doesn't add up. And um, if you, I've also observed that if you look at the church of today, we have some of the most brilliant people, some of the most, you know, when you talk of um, uh, intelligence, talk of IQs, talk of people who are smart. We have them in the church and they are doing great things in their workplaces and even in churches. They are doing awesome things. Yet, it doesn't add up. The transformation we see doesn't add up. And if you contrast that with the church of the Acts of Apostles, it's that's where you will really see that it doesn't add up. Where a man will stand up, preach a sermon that hardly, you know, five minutes, and you see 5,000 people get saved, and then you see people like Peter walking through the street. He wasn't preaching, he wasn't doing anything. His shadows were healing people who were lame and sick. You see people like Paul who they took handkerchiefs from them and they go and heal the sick. And you're like, I don't understand. Because, and then, I, I, when Jesus was selecting his disciples, I don't think he did an IQ test. Because if he did, none of his disciples qualified. They were, they were people who were... <laughs> I mean, they were here today, tomorrow, Jesus, I love tomorrow, next tomorrow, I don't know him. They were some people that really, they, they, weren't, they weren't intellectually sound. Judging by the, our, you know, our level of, they weren't a people of, you know, class. Judging by what we have today. But truth be told, they did exploits that it's like exist only in our dreams that is if at all it does today so what happened what is the issue it bothered me it's still bothering me and it bothers me something else that baffles me is the way the scriptures say something i mean certain things in scriptures that you know a bit doesn't i don't get for example in the book of ephesians chapter 3 verse 17 paul was preaching and he said something it was in his letter. He said that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. I'm like, I don't get. I thought when I received Christ, I received him into my heart. So what exactly are we talking about here? And then if you go to Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, I took this from the Passion Translation. He said, you are my dear children. Simple. But I agonize in spiritual labor pains again until the anointed one be fully formed in your heart. So these scriptures gives me a clue and tells me that something is missing somewhere. It means that the 
born again than I thought I had. I mean, I had, oh, oh, I've got it all settled because Christ is in my heart. It's over. It's done with. It means it's still remaining. There's something still remaining. And that informed my exploration. I began to explore and began to explore. And I found that just like the father or God, yes, God seemed to be in love with the number three, perfection. The Godhead we know is a tripartite being. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The temple of the Old Testament also is in three layers. We know them. The outer court, the inner court, and the holies of holies. I began to now understand that, oh, same thing, the human, the temple of the New Testament, which is you and I, we are also tripartite. The spirit, the soul, and then our bodies. Oh, I see. And then Romans 8, 16, now summed it and made me give me an understanding Romans 8 16 he said but the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children right so I got the understanding from this scripture that yes indeed I am saved the day I got saved but what happened to me was that the holies of holies the inner the spirit got saved and the Holy Spirit bore witness with my spirit that I am saved so I am saved truth I am saved the Holy Spirit is there I am saved now where is the missing gap? Remember, we said there was the soul. The soul. Which, ironically, as I began to study, I found that that was exactly what the Bible often referred to the soul as the heart. The heart of the matter. The crux of the matter. Say the heart. And I found that theologians have actually understood, even scientists and all of that, even that the heart is where the seat of another three important components of our beings are. Our intellect, our will, and our emotions. They are all there within our hearts. So when we got saved, our spirit got saved, our hearts Our heart, our heart began to get saved. If I may put it that way, it began to get saved. The issue I now really found was that the heart, as the heart of this thing, the heart, the heart being what it is, the heart is what regulates our deeds, our actions everything everything that's why the bible says as a man thinketh in where is it in his spirit is it in his spirit in his heart so he is so you might be saved in your spirit but because your heart is the way it is that is the way you are that's why we seem to be confounding the world as per we will be said to be saved yet our behavior does not seem to make sense what I found again was the fact that this heart being the center 
and being where our intellect, our will, and our emotions are is such that it can do a lot of things. Of course, that's why people who are not saved, they can do many wonderful things. You know, if you read, that should be Second Corinthians, it talks about, you know, three different kinds of men. It talks about the natural man who is unsaved. It talks about the carnal man who has, uh, who is like a baby that not grown and meaning that his heart is not transformed in any way. In, let me not say in any way. It's not transformed. And then the spiritual man. Now, as we I began to explore, I saw that this soulish man, whether he's saved or he's unsaved, can actually do a lot of things. Why? That's the seat of his intellect. He is so, he can, he is smart. He can do a lot of things. Now, do you know what, that, what happens? What now happens is that because of his supposedly great achievement, it fuels his pride. And so the heart becomes the center of pride. But you know what? Funny. The Bible describes the heart of man the untransformed heart with a few very interesting uh, uh, descriptive words that we need to pay attention to Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says the heart is wicked and deceitful it says in Galatians distinct description it says the heart opposes God as it opposes the spirit of God and then the, in Romans chapter 8 verse 13 it talks about the fact that the, the, the fruits of the flesh is death is death now it tells me that even though we have this our heart in there if we do not actively engage in getting it transformed there is a huge problem but you know one funny thing when Jesus was speaking he actually did not give room I checked, checked dig, dig dug up a lot of things that you know he said about the heart let me just say this you know I talked about the fact that the heart is the seat of pride yeah because he can do a whole lot of things without God he can do a lot of things without God so it falls his pride but do you know the, the 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 irony of it all is the fact that even when you get saved if you are not your if your heart does is not transformed you can you can actually do a lot of things soulishly deriving your strength your inspiration from your intellect from your intellectual capacity you can do a lot of things you can do church you can preach good sermons you can when you begin to do a lot of things you know what happens that evil fuels the pride the more it adds petrol to your pride your accomplishments and you know what happens because the heart of man is desperately wicked as it were it is what it is Jesus had one prescription for it. You must follow me. You must take up your cross and put the, that unregenerated heart, that seat, and you know, that heart, that soul, that, you know, I'm just keep calling it heart. That is the center. It is us. So we find ourselves many times our hearts become hardened and we are all the more tending towards worship of self rather than worship of God. Let's see a description that Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, Mark chapter 7 verse 20. The Pharisees were like, why are your disciples not washing their hands before they eat? And you know, Jesus in trying to help his disciples to understand 
better, he told them something very interesting. He said he went on to tell them, uh, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. That is, it's not what you take in. After, you know, the previous verse said, it's not what you take in that defiles you. It is what comes out of you that defiles you. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts, sexual immorality, all of that, all of that, all this. In, in the Acts of Apostles, you will see that the, he, Paul describes these things, even the apostles describe these things as works of the flesh. They is still referring to the same thing. That's why I told you that the heart, the Bible refers to the heart with several um, uh, different names. In some places, the heart, soul, or flesh. But all of it is one same thing. You know, when you read the Bible, you sometimes be amazed at the way Jesus attacked the Pharisees. You sometimes be amazed. It, at some point, he called them whitewashed tombs. He said a number of things to them. But one thing that he said to them that caught my attention is Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. He said, These people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So, you can see what I said. You know, I said the soul can do many things. Don't need God to speak. So, he falls your pride. At the end of the day, you are still singing hallelujah. You are still talking the Christian language. But your heart is far from God. Does not mean you are not saved. You are saved. But he says the heart is far from me. Now, might wonder why God is so concerned about the heart. The truth of the matter is this. Remember, we are talking about purpose, you know, in this year. We are talking about purpose, fulfillment of purpose, and all of that. A number of us have, we have our ambitions. We have our, what, you know, your whatever ambitions you have, your dreams or whatever. You know, one of the most popular um, things in the world today is you know who is the most popular person who has the most likes who has the most followers and so on and so forth it's all about marketing of self just to fuel the heart the pride more and more and what happens is that as we continue on our journey if we do not take time to sit down and reset we will find ourselves that we will drift into what we criticize the Pharisees were doing religion and it is in religion that all you do is what you just worship God with your mouth you are just mouthing it but your heart is far from him that's a very dangerous point and you know in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5 Paul described it this way having a, a form of godliness but denying the power thereof again Jesus' prescription John chapter 12 verse 24 John chapter 12 verse 24 most assuredly I say to you I say to you unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies it remains alone praise God now you know the grain right the grain of wheat right inside of it in any grain grain of corn inside of that corn inside of the corn is a potential plant sprout but what the seed does is that that seed encases it encases the sprout that part so if it goes into the ground humidity moisture and all of that works on it and then that outer shell breaks out breaks and then it begins to the real sprout comes out the shoot comes out right 
that's Jesus' prescription to us. That, hey, listen. This heart, this flesh, it must, what? Die. It must give way. And another way, it must give way. And you see, I liken us to uh, a bottle of perfume. You know, there are some perfumes that are so, the bottles are beautiful. In fact, when you finish the perfume, you might not want to throw away, discard the bottle. They are beautifully designed, right? And, but that bottle of perfume with the beautiful bottle, however beautiful it is, is the bottle is useless until the perfume comes out true or false listen i'm here to tell you this the real you your purpose god's purpose his kingdom is locked in within your spirit until the bottle you are admiring this bottle you are admiring until it breaks will not, the perfume will not serve its purpose. You remember the woman with the alabaster oil, box of oil that came to Jesus' feet and broke it and then everywhere was filled with the fragrance of the perfume? That's exactly what we have been called to. We must be broken. For us, remember another scripture that says, it said we have this treasures in where in earthen vessel we have this treasure god's glory all of god in earthen vessel until we actually get broken we will just be we are right now we are admiring the vessels oh this is a beautiful vase oh lovely bottle of perfume oh look at it. it's amazing it has many follow ah wonderful the real purpose of the bottle was to house the perfume and at the appointed time get broken so that the perfume can who wonder the bible says that we are a fragrance the fragrance describes us and that describes us as a fragrance psalm 34 verse 18 psalm 34 verse 18 it says the lord is close to the what the broken hearted psalm 34 verse 18 the lord is near to those who have a what a broken heart you actually want to encounter you want to experience god because the truth be told is that the fancifulness that we all present and all of that it's all washed, true or false? Mm, come on, at the end of the day, when you are all by yourself, you are wondering, where am I? What am I doing? You are looking for him. You are looking for him. That's the truth. Because that is the reason why you were made. That's it. So no matter how much success in court you attain, it all comes down to nothing. That's why the Bible, Jesus speaking, he says, the flesh can do, I mean, uh, the flesh profited nothing. He said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and life. The fl flesh profited nothing at the end of the day. He said, the Lord, you want to experience him. Here is it. He said, he is close to those to the broken hearted and he says those who are crushed in spirit who have a contrite spirit let's look at Isaiah chapter 57 Isaiah 57 verse 15 he said for those says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity whose name is holy now God describing himself here he tells, he's giving you his address, his location. He said, he inhabits eternity. His name is holy. I dwell in the holy, in the high and holy place with him. Now, 
after with the high and holy place he now gave an additional address with him who has a contrite and humble spirit the broken hearted that's this address now you wonder why people cannot smell God when they come near us why they cannot you know they can't perceive God when they come near us we are no different from the regulars as in everybody we are all just the same how why Psalm 6, Isaiah same Isaiah chapter 66 Isaiah chapter 66 Oh God, there are many out there who are looking for God. They are looking for God. And yet we are here on this planet and they are looking for God. Nah, there's something wrong. Now he said, Isaiah 66 verse 1. He said, Don't said the Lord. Again, God describing his address. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? All of these things that our souls and our braggadociousness is accomplishing. Where is the house you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest? Next verse, verse 2. For, for all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. What do you want to accomplish for me? Everything I've done them. But he said, what? On this one thing, on this one, will I look on him who is poor and, a, and of a contrite spirit who trembles at my word again brokenness this is his choice location this is his choice place he puts his eyes upon come on And so, a classic example, real life New Testament example that I will give us, and I will just, we just look at briefly, is the story of the prodigal son. Story of the prodigal son. That's in Luke chapter 15, verse 19. Because brokenness is not a far-fetched thing. It's something that, is, that God has made available we can see this practically in the life of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. We saw that, you know, he we know the story, not go over the story. But what did he what was his conclusion? After he had gone through, he, he, was, he has suffered. That's what thank God for hunger sometimes. You know, hunger can do a lot of things. You know, it brought him to his it adjusted his thinking and he came to himself the Bible says he came to himself in, verse, in um, Luke chapter 15 verse 18 he said I will arise and go to my father and say to him father I have sinned against heaven and before you remember that this son was all the while under his father's roof he lacked nothing right he lacked nothing but he felt I was a big boy. Men need to know me. I have ambition. I have, you don't know, I have a strong will. I have my emotions. I, you know, I, I, I have I exactitude in my judgments. I know it all. I have a PhD. I have an MSc. I have, come on, what, 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 what? And he's ventured out. Only to discover that all of those things were just same as Jesus said, the flesh profited nothing. Then he came to his senses. And I said, now I will arise and go to my father's house. And I will say, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. What was he doing here? He was acknowledging his insufficiency. He was acknowledging his as in his inability to accomplish anything outside of God. And that is the point where God is calling us to. 
the point where we acknowledge where we acknowledge where we acknowledge that we without him truly we can do nothing not some things the symptom of what i'm talking about is so clear when you know we will walk, wake up in the morning jump out and just you know you, you don't need to pray i mean you have a, you have a mind now i mean why 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 a classic example you know that but here he said i will i will go back to my father and that is where god is calling us to god is calling us to and when we get to that point here is his promise in ezekiel ezekiel chapter 36 verse 26 verse 26 ezekiel 36 26 i will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you i will remove from your heart i will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and i will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws so he said i will give you a new heart and i will put my spirit a new spirit within you that is his promise that is his promise so he said but the thing is this god will not contend with you he will not strive with you right but until just like he did to that prodigal son what happened to the prodigal son you know he, his father did not argue with him he allowed him go but until he came to his senses and then he came to that realization and spoke to himself then he went to his father and his father gave him a new heart he said i will give you a new heart i'll put a new spirit within you you know he said i will remove you know what what we have right now a number of us we have a heart of stone we hardly you know god we you know and and the thing is this when you get to that point of brokenness right what begins to happen to you is that you will supposedly begin to make foolish decisions and in the eyes of the world it, you, you won't make sense why because you see the things of god the things of the spirit are always are most times or rather yeah they oppose the things of the flesh so that's why he doesn't make sense to us a number of times but when you get when we get to that point of brokenness you know the heart actually is the place where we are able to experience god that god that is locked in our spirit we will experience him and then others around us can experience him when we come to that point of brokenness that point where we humble ourselves and say god I can't I am unable not just with our lips and then our hearts are far no right there deep within our hearts God I surrender God I am unable God I am unable I will round up with this story some of you know my little daughter uh, Jedidiah six to seven one day she went outside went outside playing with her friends and they brought her back to the house limping and then she was shouting that uh, whoever a friend told her to remove take off her shoes and she took off her shoes and then something pierced her leg so something pierced her leg and then she was initially crying little by little then when i now stepped in to try to remove that thing i never knew that this so-called little girl had the strength of 10 men we were five adults in the house we could not hold her down to remove that thing she fought with every ounce of strength that she had she fought to the point that we had I had to give up by the time she finished by the time we left her the thing was still there she stood down there crying more small all her strength was gone she was exhausted and she slept off 
When she slept off, I took the leg and performed the surgery. She didn't wink. And she woke up jumping everywhere. Daddy, you removed it. That is the point of brokenness. That point where she exhausted. You saw the prodigal son got there. Exhausted. That's where God. I don't know whether you have you have gotten there or you are still traveling. You are still experimenting, Abi. You are still trying. Right? Well done. Right done. But but those of us who are who have come to that point to say, God, God, I give up. I give up. I am incapable in my strength. I am incapable in my strength. God, I surrender. Brokenness is something that you must begin to do every day. Every day. God, as I wake up, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray. Holy Spirit, you are the one that teaches me how to pray. The Bible says you enables me. I begin to invoke his presence with my brokenness. And then I start, I, that's when I can then begin to pray in everything. That's where God wants to get you to. So we're going to initiate it. We're just going to initiate it. But I want you to go home with it. Let it become part of your daily routine. God, I cannot. I don't know how to. 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 And I understood why Paul will say, I die daily. I die daily. I die daily. This heart. And you know the funny thing is, as you begin to live your life, you'll be like, ah, no, this thing, no brother is just saying his own. This thing is not in my heart. I'm not prideful. I don't tease. I don't steal. Brother, brother, brother. Wait. Uh, that's why the Bible says the heart is terribly deceitful. Wait until certain circumstances hit you. That's when you will really know what is in your heart. That's why you mustn't wait. This is the day. This is the hour. I surrender. I surrender. I give it to God. God, I give up. I cannot do it by myself. God, I surrender. I surrender. Take my heart. Break it. Break my heart. Break it the way you want. Break it, oh God. Break it, oh God. Break it, oh God. started in the first level meaning you're not saved or you are saved but you have drifted you 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 used to you know you have drifted so far away God is calling you God is saying you can trust me because I love you with an everlasting love is a greater love can no one have other than to lay down his life. You can't have, I've laid down my life for you. I love you. I can be trusted. Give me your heart. My son, give me your heart. My daughter, give me your heart. Let's take this song one more time. I surrender one more time. Just once. And make peace. Make that prayer. Talk to Jesus. Ask him to come into your heart. Ask him to come and save you. Oh!
Pray that prayer sincerely. Please, you can meet any of the team of ministers afterwards to guide you, to pray with you. Now we're going to break bread. As we break this bread, I want you to remember how he was crushed. What he is asking us to do is not what he has not done. He himself was crushed, broken, pierced. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. As we take this bread, we break it, signifying that in Christ I am broken. And so I come to you broken today, O oh God, as I rededicate and surrender my heart to you. Thank you, Jesus. Let the life of God that dwells within my spirit, within your spirit, flow to your mortal bodies right now and quicken up, quicken you as you partake of this in Jesus' name. Jesus for your blood that was shed by this blood we know that however we have messed up we can come to you and receive clean sin thank you Jesus we come right now we receive clean sin we receive forgiveness we receive your warm embrace we receive your garment of royalty. We receive the crown that you are placing on our head as a welcome party for us right now. We receive it all, Lord, with thanksgiving. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Take the cup. Thank you. Transform, transform